Pushing the limits is always important to us, and that's just one of the ways we're doing this, and we're enjoying it. Business of Architecture, episode 305. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we explore the intersection between design and enterprise, otherwise known as the business of architecture. Today we explore an alternate career path for architects. Our guest went from a career in architecture into architectural industrial design. He's worked on many high profile projects, creating custom lighting installations and other furnishings. Our guest is Gerald Olesker, founder of ADG Lighting. In today's episode, you'll discover his path about how he went from a career in architecture to building a successful design and manufacturing company. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Dream Practice Accelerator, the leading business design program specifically for architecture firm owners. Whether you're an early stage startup, mid-career firm owner, or a mature practice, the Dream Practice Accelerator can help you design and create a firm that gives you creative freedom, fulfillment, and financial abundance. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash reviews to discover more. And with that, let's get on with today's show. Hello, Gerald, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you, Enoch, for having me this morning. Yeah, it's glad to, it's great to have you on. So I'd like to start out just by asking you how you got into the field of architectural industrial design. All by mistake, actually. I uh, started as a uh, young architect and was pursuing a very interesting career with Galper Balden working on the front side of client activation and dealing with new projects rather than on the back side drafting. I wanted to learn about architecture and they had given me a wonderful opportunity. I was young and hungry to learn. And through that process through that journey while I was driving around the uh, streets of Beverly Hills, Malibu, Bel Air, wherever, I started to notice that there were lots of job sites in, in the early 90s that an opportunity just to get that design flair going, because when you're in your early 20s and just graduated uh, from a school of architecture, as I did, you almost look too inexperienced to land an entire large job. So I wanted to craft and begin to engage with more design professionals. So I'd knock on that proverbial door, but it was just a job site uh, frame out, two by fours and a header. And I would say to uh, the superintendent, does anyone need custom lighting? At that time, people just went to stores to buy it. It was pretty cool that they would say, well, what do you mean? What do you got? What do you have? So I said, I have nothing, but I would take out a sketchbook and quickly sketch something for the project. Well, that led the opportunity for them to say, please speak with the designer, or please speak with the architect. And I would, again, take out my sketchbook, discuss the architectural aspect of the project, and design as if I was someone in that office, kind of like what Kim Mead and White used to do, uh, where they would design the light fixtures onto their building. And that snowballed. One project led to the next, to the next. And before I knew it, by the time I was 34, I had completed 700 plus projects worldwide. So being prolific gave me an opportunity to meet more architects and designers. I fell in love with what I was doing because I could touch more projects than just being an architect. And fast forward to today and, uh, you know, two decades into the uh, 21st century and we're doing lighting, furniture, furnishings, architectural ornament details, um, and having a great time. Tell me about the firm you first worked for straight out of school. How long were you with that firm? So, any uh, any architect listening this morning to your podcast will will know that we all needed these internship hours. Well, I had so many internship hours. I had twice as many uh, as the most students required because I wanted to 
really know more about architecture. So I was I was working for a construction engineering firm building the USC teaching hospital. I moved to some cities. I wore tool bags and framed. When I got to Galper Balden, they were a unique firm because they were a landscape architecture firm that also specialized in interiors and product development. So one of the really neat things about that firm was Cleo Balden, who was uh, a professor of design, and she uh, was a very well-noted um, professional in terms of their projects, upper end residential, they did museums, public projects, took me aside one day because I, I was a snotty, uh, you know, young 20 something, uh, interning for them and said, Hey, how does a designer work in architecture? I don't get it. And, uh, she took me by the hand and said, Oh honey, you don't get it. Space is space. So that hedge over there defines the space and that becomes an outdoor living space. That piece of furniture designs, uh, you know, defines the interiors and, started pointing out that how we approach a project is all about the development of the space. That led to years later me using this curbside to poolside analogy of, of how we approach a project. But Cleo was nice enough to enlighten me and uh, open my eyes up to a very different world of what architecture really is. I was blessed. And how long were you at that firm approximately? Two years, um, an early two years of my career, but an incredible um, office on the uh, beach in Venice on the boardwalk and a lot going on, a lot of great projects. And my interaction when I was at that firm was also with the Society of Historical um, uh, architectural historians, uh, LA Conservancy. And so I was interacting with really some neat professionals out there, Francis Anderton from, uh, from uh, back then, uh, her uh, magazine. And it, it was really quite a great experience that opened doors that would never have been open for me otherwise. And place me in time here. When was it that you were driving around from job site to job site and asking if they wanted lighting designs? <laughs> Early 90s. So we... Um, so was it while you were working at that architecture firm or was it a little bit later? Kind of give me the timeline here. Was. It actually was. Um, I remember actually an interview that Sid had, Sid Galper, with Home Magazine. And we were driving around in his uh, old brown Mercedes and the woman from home was in the front seat and she said, Sid, why are the streets of Beverly Hills so beautiful? Why are the homes so beautiful? And he said, they're not. Let me point this out to you. And he started pointing out ugly gardens, ugly facades, um, dead bushes in the front of these homes. He says, what's beautiful about Beverly Hills are the streets, and they're all well-groomed. The city maintains an incredible cityscape. As we were driving around and I was noticing the construction at the time, I saw this opportunity of, hey, wait, while I'm working with Sid, I can make this transition and I can do some of these side projects. And because they were uh, well versed in product design, they allowed me to kind of double dip, if you may, and go ahead and try my hand at some other uh, things, being the lighting part, and I then launched my company from there. Did you always have an entrepreneurial drive? I think I did. I, I remember as a, a, a kid playing business in my uh, parents' office. <laughs> no one ever said, um, you know, you can't. They always said, we're going to give you the tools and you have to figure it out. So the old credit card slide machines, I remember them giving me that and a Sears charging plate. And I would just take credit card forms and fill them out as a kid or, or uh, draw diagrams and uh, had a father and a mother who both said, 
do whatever you want to do. Just be uh, honest about what you do and be forthright. So that was uh, quite quite an opportunity as a um, you know, young young person to have someone tell you it's okay, just go do it. So I don't I didn't know any different. Gerald, a lot of people would be uncomfortable. Uh, outside their comfort zone, going to job site to job site, talking to superintendents. Was it that way for you or are you naturally more introverted and you enjoyed that? Tell me about that. Um, I actually think I didn't know any different. So introvert or extrovert, I don't know if that's necessarily the right description for the way I approached it. I was hungry to learn. And from my perspective, the ability to learn comes from the ability to ask questions. And going job site to job site, I didn't approach it as, hey, can I sell you something? I approached it with a question and the inquisitivity of wanting to know more about what was going on with their project. I truly thought one day I would work myself back into a a really cool architecture job. Um, I was sponsored early on with the AIA Associates uh, by someone that Skidmore owns in Merrill. I, you know, was meeting people and talking to people. So it, it had nothing to do with trying to make a lot of money or trying to get so many projects under my belt. It really had to do with wanting to know more about architecture. Great. So you had this hunger for learning, this this desire to learn and, and grow as a as a designer. And tell me about your first job. Can you walk me through that? What's the first commission you got? Um, The very first, I'll call it the true commission, was a home in La Cunada, Flintridge. And way back when, um, a million dollars bought you uh, a two-acre property and about a 9,000-square-foot home, which... uh, Actually, I think by most of the country standards is extremely expensive still. Um, that house today is probably about a $12 million home. We, we had approached the, the, the homeowner, and I had you know, asked, what do your plans look like? What, what, what does your home look like? And he, he showed me a rendering, and it was this French Baroque, heavy encrusted with detail, Corinthian columns, just oozing and dripping with everything um, that a uh, French Baroque project would have. And I really just kind of scratched my head because he says, hey, I'd like to buy some light fixtures, was his comment. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to sell you because I don't have anything to sell you. But what I'd like to be able to do is design something if you give me the opportunity. So he said, okay, show me what you have. And I went back uh, to my studio and I opened up my Sir Bannister Fletcher and started reading French Baroque. What is French Baroque? You know, we didn't have an internet to really Google back then. So I grabbed every history book I had from uh, my education and started reading. Once I understood what was going on in that time period and how things were potentially made, I rolled out a big uh, roll of yellow trace and had a uh, fountain pen in my hand, and I just started sketching. And I took cues off of uh, Saint-Gervais, which... uh, was a uh, which is a church in Paris and Saint Sulpice, and looked at those as Baroque influences, not copying the light fixtures, but looking at the buildings, and began to sketch out. Came to the owner and said, "Hey, this is what I think belongs on your home." I was lucky enough that he said, "Those are pretty amazing," and uh, let's do it. Well, two acres though it wasn't applying fixtures to the front of the home. It was starting at the street, the columns, the approach. All I knew as a young architect was this um, approach, anticipation, and arrival. I just, I just knew how to go through a, a, a site. I, I didn't know that lighting design had anything to do with sighting. 
but that's how I, I approached it, as I still do today in the master's course I just gave. Uh, we talked about that. So the level of how does the light bring you through the property allowed me to detail out posts within the landscape as it went around the paths and the curves. And, you know, they had waterfalls and ponds and gardens. So the way to illuminate those were to say, well, here, let's do this beautiful, um, I'll call it shepherd's crook post with a, you know, beautiful lantern pendant hanging off of it. I just imagined myself if I was in, you know, Paris way back when. And that was the start. Was there any moment when you got that first commission that you're thinking, oh, wow, what did I get myself into here? How am I going to pull this off? Well, then we had to build the pieces. Exactly. <laughs> so that was, he says, this is great. How are you going to build them? And um, I just kind of went, nah, I'll build them. We'll, we'll figure this out. I'll get you a price. We'll make it work. Um, talked to my parents and said, you know, uh, where do I go? How do we do it? You know? and uh, was guided in a, in a direction. I mean, I, I, I did know vendors and people at the time from working with uh, you know, Galper Balden, so I was able to reach out and, and have those discussions. From that, all these years later, you know, uh, we've built two factories uh, on the ADG team. We have incredible artisans that provide and produce our um, product that we're very thankful for. And you know, we figured it out. And we're still figuring it out because we push the limits here as an architectural industrial designer that I prefer to be called, not a lighting designer. Um, we push the limits and we create new patterns, new methods of uh, of of manufacturing and sometimes we just go back to traditional methods for very extreme and modern fixtures but look at material use and how can we bring something forward in the design environment enhancing the architecture not about making some standoff piece unless that's what the client wants how did you get that first commission actually manufactured tell me about that there were uh, a couple uh, artisans in uh, downtown L.A. that uh, I had gone to and uh, figured out, you know, hey, can you make these uh, pieces and worked with them on the sheet metal. They were solid uh, brass and bronze fixtures. There was curved glass. I mean, these, these pieces flared out like a Botticelli chest. So, yeah, I mean, a Botticelli. And so the... Um, you know, the the curves and the compound curves and glass work needed to be done. So I found someone who slumped glass, went through, found uh, castings and components that we could uh, embellish the fixtures with, integrate into the style and the detail, and had them manufactured. Soon after, um, I realized we needed to do things differently. Uh, this is my third business in the space. So I was working with my um, mother at the time, also calling on my father and asking him, who, was in, who taught me so much about craftsmanship and detail. How can we do this? What do I need to do? What are the processes? And was able to um, cobble together a team, as we say, uh, while we cobbled together the light fixtures. Didn't know I was an entrepreneur at the moment. I was just, again, someone trying to uh, uh, prove my, my spot in the industry. And when did you make, in your words, the shift from someone making your spot in the industry to feeling like you're an entrepreneur? Um, when my first company imploded. <laughs> Uh, as a family business, it was tough working with family. What was um, your first business, I, Gerald? Uh, it was in lighting. It was it was in lighting. Um, but we we had. Um, so was this before together. or after that first commission? Kind of a concurrent, if you may. It, it was it was all happening at the same time. Um, I uh, 
I had, um, you know, I, I was freelancing, if you may, right? And the transition from Galper Baldwin to working with my, um, on my own, that just was a very natural progression when I said goodbye to them and said, look, I'd like to go do this thing on my own. They were wonderful and wished me the best of luck. I mean, they're the people who invented the, the lounge in the spa or the jacuzzi. As we know, the, the comfortable positions in the jacuzzi, they're the ones who invented that. They did furniture and furnishing. So they, they actually wished me well. And um, I transitioned and started a company with my uh, family and for many years worked with them building something up. But the ability to function in family businesses sometimes is so tumultuous. It's either wonderful or it's not. And we, we had both. I, I look back and I'm, I'm very happy that I had that time together, but it got to a point where I wanted to grow and do other things. My family wanted to do things the way they wanted to. And so I wished uh, my mother and sister the best of luck, and I had to go start something else, which became ADG, or Architectural Detail Group, thinking I was going to go back to architecture, and I didn't. <laughs> why, why did you start that first business with your family? Comfort. Um, I... Uh, I was always at a, a young age going around, you know, uh, doing, you know, to say odd jobs. I was, I, was, I was always trying to make a couple dollars. I was never really that great paycheck person working for other people. I um, had the opportunity to um, work with people that I knew. So the roll into family was, again, not really planned. It was just a natural progression, if you may. Um, from that point, once I uh, realized 10 plus years later that in order to grow, I really had to do things different. I had uh, become a member uh, of EO, Los Angeles, Entrepreneurs Organization LA, which is a... Uh, peer-to-peer, -peer, they say networking, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer group that provides entrepreneurs who um, are, were under 40 at the time and did over a million dollars in business and were the founders of their businesses to join together and share experiences. Uh, we all have very similar experiences as entrepreneurs in business. And I realized that it's, not easy being an entrepreneur and the opportunity to um, to share and learn from others again that came from my hungering to to just build my knowledge base was the opportunity to grow and from there that I don't want to say aided in the implosion of my uh, family business but it helped where we needed to move on and create a new business venture or opportunity. And that was the birth of Architectural Detail Group, which then became ADG Lighting as one of its subsets. And you know, we do some other things as well. What would you say would be the primary business lessons that you learned uh, in terms of importance in your involvement with EO and just making that transition from someone who was running a business to someone who was entrepreneur? So business lessons, um, you know, one of the best values in terms of growing a business is having a team that you can support and supports you. So while there may be delegation, the way we work here at ADG is team support, and we also say, happy client. So the lessons in EO that I got from my forum, from other EO members globally, for me, was about taking care of the client and taking care of your team. So, so important. 
Um, I was only able to take care of my clients and take care of my team because that became the primary objective. The money, the, the uh, attributes, awards, all that stuff has nothing to do with producing a great product and having a team that supports it. To me, it has more to do with being in an opportunity that and placing the opportunity that supports your team and your client. For you, what is the key to taking care of your team? Interestingly, um, one of my forum mates who ran a very, or still runs a very successful law firm, and he had 400 attorneys uh, nationally, it was all about the metrics. So we look at architecture, design, and fabrication, and talk about we need, we need, we need. The clients say, we need, we need, we need. The contractors, the designers, the homeowners, we need, we need. Because of that need, the metrics are so important to our daily process. And if our team all buys into that and agrees, the process and the, the stability of the process that we've developed at ADG Lighting and our, our subsets of ADG, of Architectural Detail Group, that process helps to control the chaos of design, all of the clients needs, 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 our, our team on the fabrication side, their needs, our vendors, their needs. And we've worked hard as a team to develop this process. I learned that from my good uh, friend and forum mate uh, in terms of what he did for his law firm because as an entrepreneur, as a business, again, our needs are very similar. Our byproduct being this incredible uh, lighting, furniture, furnishings, architectural elements that we make are the byproduct of our process. You mentioned metrics being the key to taking care of your team. What metrics specifically do you look at and are monitoring and, and go to having a successful team? I love that you're asking that question, Enoch. It, it, it is so important. You know, we, we have a flow chart that talks about the process. So if I could, you know, discuss as a case study, you know, a client, a designer or an architect will come to us with a need or a want. I want something to look a certain way. They'll show us a picture they've downloaded off of, uh, you know, Architectural Digest or some other website. And I typically cringe when I get that because they say, please copy this or give me, give me a price. It's counterintuitive to the design process. You know, McKim Mead and White or Lewis Kahn or, or Frank Lloyd Wright, any, any great architect designed and developed with their team all of the elements that went into the architecture. They didn't spec and buy and apply onto the walls. So the design process is on the left side of our chart, and the right side of our chart says, client gave us a, a directive to make this, right? Now, the design directive is a retainer or a process that we say, okay, we're going to be involved in developing as part of the architecture from curbside to poolside, your lighting, your ornament, your detail, whatever, whatever they've hired us on for. The right side is client handed us a photo and said, can we make this? Or looked at something we did on our website in the past and said, how much? Well, typically we still have to ask, what's the application? How are we integrating it into the architecture, size, scale, detail? What, what are your room elevations or facade elevations or integration within the property? Once we've determined the left side or the right side of our flow chart, we move into this kind of analysis or quoting phase and then put that together 
We have some very specific spreadsheets in terms of how we walk a project, what we're looking for, and what our spread is on the project. And then we move down the flow chart and discuss, well, we need to keep moving forward, so we have to have this betrothal to each other. Give me money. Give me a wedding ring, right? Once we have that active engagement, then we continue through the process and we have some additional subsets. We have shop drawings, full scale, we'll bring out to a job site, we'll integrate, we'll hold up, we'll talk about all of these elements and how they function within the architecture or the architectural setting, and then continue down the line to production and then through production um, with submittals and other, other details. We then want to have delivery. Well, our bottom line on our flow chart says happy client. It doesn't say delivery really bitching goods, the best products in the world. It says happy client because each client project is so subjective. The ability for us to develop what their needs are has to go through this process. Now, that's only the forward facing part. Internally, uh, we have our weekly meetings and are reviewing the anywhere between 34 to 60 projects a quarter that we run. In addition to that, we have our um, sales side and we look at what the client's needs are at any given time and where are they in their process. You know, are they ready to give us a deposit and move forward? Do they need another month, a year, a week? What are those things? And we run these charts, which all were developed as a as a offshoot of what my forum mate the attorney had done in his business for looking at how do they protect their clients needs so the similarities in terms of process are there but the the byproduct being improve, you know providing legal services and we're providing beautiful product uh, is is really the same You've had remarkable success working on a, a lot of high-profile projects and have a, a large team. As you mentioned, you have two manufacturing facilities. When, when you look at that, what do you think has been the key in your mind to landing new projects, getting your name out there, and making those sales? In early years, it was perseverance. Tell me about in that. In later years. Tell me about that. And perseverance. <laughs> perseverance. <laughs> it really is. Um, Perseverance in what? What did you do? What were the actions that you were persevering on? So in earlier years, uh, as, as the Internet started to come into play, you, know, you, put, you put your wares on the Internet and said, look at what I've done. But it still didn't um, answer the question of who are we, what do we do, what do I do, what are my talents and my skills? And going job site to job site and engaging with these architects. And when I was, you know, in my early 20s, I was just fortunate enough that living in Southern California, having access via car and driving around communities, whether it was Pasadena, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Bel Air, Malibu, San Diego, and, and, and Rancho Santa Fe, up to Montecito in that local area that I could drive within two hours. What I found is I would look for the job sites that particularly interested me. I would, again, knock on that job site door and I would just ask the questions. Once I found out and discovered who was involved with the project, I was really lucky enough to meet the people that were not the movers and shakers then, but they were just equally uh, opportunistic and uh, in the right place for themselves building their architectural or their design careers. So when you are working on a project and Guasme Siegel is the architecture firm, you walk onto a project and Mark Appleton is the architecture firm, and I can go through that list. You can go to our website and download and, and, and see it all if you really want. The ability to interact 
my father, my father-in-law, and, and, and Sid Galper all told me, just return phone calls. People don't even do that today because they're still, they just want to text. But return a phone call. Have that conversation with the design professional or, or the homeowner, whoever you're working with. And answer the questions. Go through the steps. It's okay to say no. It's okay to be told no. But the perseverance is make sure you have been accountable and follow through with your responsibility. That doesn't occur a lot today. It's, it's unfortunate that um, it's not being taught and, and it doesn't happen, at least in the architectural industry. So the perseverance then becomes a chase. But we keep track of that information statistically and look at what do we need to do. And until someone says, no, thank you, we're not interested. That might not even mean we're not interested for the future. It just means at that moment they're not interested. And so we clarify that. And once we do, we document it. And we're able to um, circle back at some point. Gerald, where do you see ADG design, lighting, going from here? This past year, we've brought on a couple unique opportunities. One is a, a product called Lumacore, and Lumacore is an incredible product. They, they started out making the fuselage interiors for Boeing, and they continued on through the uh, years and now do decorative architectural elements. Well, we are able to become an architectural integrator of the product and push the limits. So no different than I push the limits in our own factories of product and how we use product, we are able to take the LumaCore and integrate it into our designs. I have one project where an entire wall on the first story and the second story of this Home is a fragmented Mondrian-esque uh, wall. We're using Lumacore, and we've integrated a lighting scheme into it. It is incredible. It's got depth. Most to the the architect came to me and asked if we could just use, um, you know, mirrored glass, and I said no. We want to use this as a product because we can. Im embellish the architecture in a method that is giving the homeowner, the architect, and the designer what they were looking for, which is depth, which is something so much different than just a reflective mirror. And we've used the product in a manner that Lumicore even called me the other day and asked me for photographs of the samples and the submittals that we had pr had them produce for us for the client, for another one of their clients, because they saw that there's this unique opportunity to use the product in that manner. So pushing the limits is always important to us. And that's just one of the ways we're doing this and we're enjoying it. Great. So what I'm hearing is that the future involves more innovation and you're going to continue to push the limits and you're not going anywhere anytime soon. Not going anywhere anytime soon. We uh, actually have a um, open job search right now for some more project management individuals in different areas. Uh, we're looking for people in San Francisco and Austin where we have uh, a number of existing projects and we're looking for people to be able to take on and exemplify those uh those projects. Incredible. Well, Gerald, thank you for joining me today on the Business of Architecture podcast, sharing your information, your, your journey with us. And tell me, how can our listeners find out more about ADG Lighting and its different subsets? Look for the best buildings in your town and you'll just see, you know, our work. <laughs> Actually, our website is filled with an incredible amount of information adglighting.com. You can go on to that. You can look at the About Us section, current projects, project downloads, lookbooks, videos, client lists. We're, we're an open book. 
because we know that uh, just like the Grateful Dead said, share it all, just buy the ticket. So we are uh, out there for people to see our work, engage, call, ask any questions, email, and adglighting.com is where you'll find it. Gerald Olesker, thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you, Enoch. This is uh, really a great opportunity for us to share the business side rather than the design side, so I do appreciate all those great questions. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.